Hi, it's Dwyer, dwyercrime.blog, also keepingitfree.blogspot.com. Let's talk about Robert Oppenheimer, and let's suggest an alternative history. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, of course, there is a great, and it is great, award-winning movie, Oppenheimer, with great acting. Gillian Murphy, outstanding job. He's already won some acting awards, right? But the movie's a bit too convenient for my taste. We're supposed to believe that Carl Fuchs was the spy for Russia at Los Alamos, right? J. Robert Oppenheimer is supposed to have been an idealist who had no real culpability in terms of the leaking of atomic secrets to the Soviet Union and other countries. Right? Well, let's just point out that it's very important, especially in situations like this, to think about alternative theories to history based on the facts. Right? What I found is that biases that we had in the 1930s and in the 1940s will carry over for generations. You have a whole group of people who are being underestimated, who the public doesn't know the full story about who the public can't envision that that person could ever do something untoward that's outside of the historical narrative that's ruling at that moment in time, right? For example, in the Oppenheimer movie, they show you Oppenheimer meeting with Harry S. Truman. Now, Truman did integrate parts of the armed forces. But of course, history has conveniently forgotten that at one point, Truman was actually a member of the Ku Klux Klan. But I believe real students of history need to see the pluses and the minuses to figure out what actually happened. They shouldn't make up history. Now, one of the problems I have with artificial intelligence, AI, is the idea that winners write history. Are we, as a society, going to end up relying too heavily on the AI winners? Recently, you had a scandal with Google's AI because they, of course, were portraying the founding fathers of the United States as people of color. Right? If history can be distorted like that, we have to hold on to the facts, and we have to question widely held beliefs, especially when one version of events is enhanced in an award-winning popular movie, especially when people aren't looking critically at events. Let's explore the idea here in this video that Oppenheimer himself, who is portrayed as primarily an academic in the movie, right, an academic where he just happens to be in certain scenes and the people around him just happen to have a certain political bent, right, he just happens to end up at Cal Berkeley, right, a school, of course, with a long history of leading protests at different times in American history, right? Think about the free speech movement at Berkeley in the 1960s, right? Understand, Berkeley is a campus where the Black Panthers used to hand out Chinese communist books, right, on campus. Well, let me just point out that it might be possible and please, just look at history, that Oppenheimer himself was an acute risk-taker with strong 
communist sympathies and that third parties may have covered up and destroyed evidence of Los Alamos nuclear bomb secrets that Oppenheimer may have given to third parties. Right In the movie, we're supposed to believe that Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer's landlord just happens to be a communist. Right, folks? Maybe the people around Oppenheimer tend to have a high incidence of being communists because Oppenheimer is picking the people around him. Right? His girlfriend, Jean Tatlock, is not fully developed in the movie. They show a young woman. She looks like she's just part of a scene. Right? It's the 1930s. We don't stop and think that she might actually be a major player. We don't stop and think that the historical narrative might actually be a bit sexist. Might actually be from the 1930s and 40s when we might not have fully understood that women could be high-level espionage operatives. Understand the surveillance of her and the wiretapping of her phone by law enforcement. Those are historical truths. Are not emphasized in the movie. The time gap between when she drowns in her bathtub, when her body is discovered, when her papers are sorted through and some destroyed in the fireplace by her father, who happens to have been a fellow faculty member of Oppenheimer's Cal Berkeley, before the police are called. And understand, the father doesn't call the police. He actually calls a funeral home first. Is not emphasized in the movie. The fact that Oppenheimer, at 32, a member of Berkeley's faculty, decides to date the 22-year-old daughter of a fellow faculty member, and that daughter happens to be a communist, isn't fully explored in the movie. Nor is the fact that Oppenheimer is dating Gene Tatlock for four years before Oppenheimer marries his wife. Right? Let me just point out too that after Oppenheimer marries his wife, Oppenheimer continues to see Tatlock for several more years, even visiting her apartment while that apartment we now know was under law enforcement surveillance. There again, that's not fully emphasized in the movie. In the movie, you see a young woman with a substance abuse problem. In real life, Jean Tatlock is much more complicated. The movie undersells Tatlock's accomplishments. She meets Oppenheimer while she is a graduate student at Stanford Medical School. She becomes a psychiatrist. Folks, she's a doctor. She's high-powered. She's not just a woman with psychiatric and substance abuse problems. No, no, this is a high-powered Stanford-educated psychiatrist. She's not a low-functioning person. The reality, to me, might be very different. That she's a high-functioning doctor who may have been involved as a conduit between Oppenheimer and communist operatives. Let's be clear here. There's a moment in the movie where a scientist comes in, I believe it's Neil Bors, 
and is talking about his conversation with, you know, some rival government that's trying to develop a nuclear weapon. And as he talks, the scientists start laughing in the background because they realize that other government has some foundational facts wrong, is trying an approach that's ineffective. Well, let's follow that through. All Oppenheimer has to do to violate national security would be to talk to his communist girlfriend during one of the times they're together, right? After, of course, he's married to a woman who herself is a communist, right? All he has to do is talk to his communist girlfriend and summarize the breakthroughs they've made in Los Alamos. If a certain type of plutonium didn't work, if a ratio was off, if some core belief was mistaken, he wouldn't have to give his communist girlfriend who's 10 years younger than him, who has a medical degree and a Stanford educated, he, he wouldn't have to give her secret documents. He could just talk to her about the approaches that worked. Right? Understand, Tadlock is in communist circles. I'm assuming the communist circles that are bent on getting nuclear secrets would know what to do with this information, would be able to say to their scientists, we've heard that this approach doesn't work. We've heard that this ratio of uranium to plutonium works best. We understand that theoretically a hydrogen bomb can work based on this tidbit, that our operative Gene Tadlock, I should say Dr. Gene Tadlock, heard from Oppenheimer. Well, folks, that's not explored in the movie. That's simply not explored in the movie. Let me make a few other points. One narrative is that Tadlock kills herself. She kills herself in January of 1944. I need for people to think about the timing here. Right, folks? That's in the thick of the war. Right? Germany folds in 44. We're bombing Japan in 45. Tadlock is supposed to have killed herself in January of 1944. Right? That's the official narrative. Right? Supposedly she is on drugs and she sticks her head in her bathtub. She did suffer from depression. Right? Understand, she's a psychiatrist, so she would understand the strengths and weaknesses of her personal situation. Right? And if you believe the suicide narrative, she kills herself. But just to understand, there are facts that suggest that it's not a suicide. Right? There is unexplained coral hydrate in her body. Not only that, she had not been drinking that night. The coral hydrate can't be explained by alcohol. Her body also showed, by the way, that she was a heavy drinker because her pancreas is somewhat damaged. Right? Let's just say coral hydrate would be an excellent way to kill someone while making it look like a suicide. To this day, we don't have a proper explanation on how the coral hydrate gets in her body. Now let's be clear here. Let's just talk about risk taking. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with risk-taking. What I am saying, though, is 
this picture of Oppenheimer as some studious academic who just happens to be around communists, right? His girlfriend's a communist, his wife's a communist. Uh, at one point, uh, he takes his kid to be held, his young child to be held by a communist family, right? This is in the movie because he realized that his wife wasn't the best mother and he wasn't the best father. So in that moment, who's going to care for my young baby? He picked the communist family. Right, folks? While the Bay Area has communists, and I understand people have some interesting thoughts on San Francisco, I'm just telling you that even by Bay Area standards, the number of communists that J. Robert Oppenheimer is around is astounding here. We'll understand the risk he's taking. He's 32. He decides to get with a 22-year-old who's a communist. Right? Gene Tadlock. Um, Tadlock also is struggling with her sexuality. Now today, we have a much better grip on the rights of gays, the idea of equal opportunity in 2024. Just understand that Tatlock is a bisexual woman in 1936. Right? She meets Oppenheimer. She thinks something is wrong with her because she's not a dyke, right? She's not a masculine lesbian. She is a very feminine lesbian. So she thinks that something's wrong with her, right? She's in the mental health field. Unfortunately, that was the dominant paradigm being taught in the mental health field at that time. That homosexuality was some kind of social pathology. Right, so just to understand, Oppenheimer starts a relationship with not just a work colleague's daughter, who's 10 years younger than him, and he's a member of the faculty of Berkeley, physics professor, right? But of course, she's an alcoholic, and she's a lesbian. In other words, this guy has picked someone unique, right, who I'm guessing, given the morals of the time, given the fact that homosexuality was viewed at that time as, you know, something awful, a mental health abnormality, right? You understand that J. Robert Oppenheimer is a risk taker. Playing it safe is not in his DNA, right? He's not living to portray a certain corporate image. No, this is the risk taker who's willing to date a work colleague's daughter. Now, let me just point out that he meets his girlfriend, Jean Tatlock, through his landlady, who, of course, is a member of the Communist Party. Right now, the couple engages in a very passionate relationship. This doesn't come through clearly in the movie, but just to understand how close they were, Oppenheimer proposes to Tatlock twice. He wanted to marry her. Right now, the couple, of course, continues seeing each other. Folks, this is a love affair. So, of course, Oppenheimer, who gets around, gets Kitty Harrison, a different woman, pregnant. That's while he's dating Jean Tatlock. Now, he marries Kitty Harrison, 
November 1st, 1940. Would it shock you to know that Harrison, of course, is a Communist Party member? And believe it or not, two months after November 1st, right? New Year's, 1941. Who's he with? Not Kitty Harrison, folks. He's with Gene Tatlock. Right, folks? That's how close he was with Tatlock. Two months after getting married, his two-month anniversary is spent with Gene Tatlock. We also know, too, that he met her another time at the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco. Let me just make a few other points here. We also know that he meets Tadlock on June 14th, 1943. Folks, Los Alamos is up and running at this point. Right? Oppenheimer supposedly is in Berkeley to recruit an administrative assistant. Where does he end up? He ends up across the bay. Right, folks? There's a bridge between San Francisco and Berkeley. He ends up in San Francisco at Gene Tadlock's San Francisco apartment. We know that they went to a Mexican restaurant. We know that they then went to the apartment and spent the night together. How do we know this? Because members of U.S. Army law enforcement were on the street outside of Tadlock's apartment and had the couple under surveillance. So when Oppenheimer visits Tadlock, understand, Tadlock is being surveilled. Now, I think the movie blows it because the idea is who leaked U.S. atomic secrets to the Russians? What exactly was Oppenheimer's involvement in that? Well, folks, Oppenheimer is sleeping with two communist women, his wife and Kelly Tatlock. Now, he claims he never saw Tatlock again after the middle of 1943. How could he if he's living in Los Alamos? In other words, folks, he has very little opportunity while he's working on the bomb to actually visit civilians. Right? He's in the desert in New Mexico. Just to understand the little time he has. He spent some of it at Kelly Tatlock's, excuse me, Gene Tatlock's San Francisco apartment. Now, I need for people to get the sequence of Tatlock's death. And just to understand, when He's at Tatlock's apartment. He could easily say, yeah, the ratio of uranium to plutonium is 4 to 7. I'm just making up numbers, right? We found that the metal casing should be done this way. Um, you know, earlier prototypes didn't work until we made these changes. He can verbally give her instructions and she can write them down. Or perhaps he could give her papers that she could then pass on to people in communist circles. Understand, her father is a Cal Berkeley professor. As they point out in the movie too, right? There is a Chevalier situation where someone approaches Oppenheimer and hints that there is someone willing to help serve as a conduit in leaking atomic secrets to the Russians. Right? So just understand, Tadlock is in those circles. It wouldn't take much for Oppenheimer to pass information on to her. So let's talk about how Tadlock's body 
Tatlock's body is found on January the 5th, 1944. Right? Believe it or not, it's Oppenheimer's co-worker, Tatlock's father, who shows up at her apartment at 1405 Montgomery Street at around 1 p.m. on January the 5th, 1944. He rings the doorbell. No one lets him in. So he, of course, climbs through a window. He finds his daughter dead. This is the official story. He finds his daughter dead, lying on a pile of cushions in the bathroom with her head under water in the partially filled bathtub. There's a suicide note, but folks, it's an unsigned suicide note. Now let me... Let me make a few points here. If you're involved in espionage, an unsigned suicide note might be something you do as a matter of course so that in the event that you are killed and people want to cover it up, they have a suicide note that you've already written that they could then claim was the suicide note. Who would know Gene Tatlock's apartment better than Gene's father, who presumably, since he knew how to climb in through the window, um, was close to his daughter and knew where things could be found in the apartment. Well, just understand, the alleged suicide note is unsigned. Let me just say this too. Her father then starts going through her correspondence, right? Items that conceivably could have shown that Jean Tatlock was involved in espionage, right? The father goes through correspondence. The father then starts burning letters and photographs in the fireplace that's in the apartment. Now, while the father arrived at 1 p.m., understand, it's not until four hours later at 5.10 p.m. that he calls the Halstead Funeral Home, who contacted the police. Folks, by then, Tatlock's apartment has been sanitized. Right? The father has gotten rid of correspondence. No one knows, apart from possible killers, whoever gave her the coral hydrate, no one knows that Tadlock has been killed until hours have passed after the father is there, lets himself in, and then is getting rid of photos and correspondence. Of course, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that at the time of her death, she was under FBI surveillance and her phone was tapped. So let me just say, the Oppenheimer story makes for a great movie. But people need to understand that Oppenheimer was a guy who is married to a communist woman, is involved with another communist woman who he want, asked twice to marry him, right? And just understand, neither of these women was hiding the fact that they were communists, right? Let me just say, too, that Tadlock introduced Oppenheimer to the poetry of John Donne. And, of course, people believe that it's the poetry of John Donne that led to Oppenheimer naming the first nuclear gadget Trinity. That's the impact that Tatlock had on him. That's how close Oppenheimer was to Tatlock. So in real time, I know in the movie they try to make this argument 
that the social climate changed in the 50s. And it did, right? McCarthy, of course, starts, you know, going after anyone who has any ties with communism. But what I need for people to understand is in real time, forget the 50s, right? Just understand in the 30s, the mid-30s, Oppenheimer has a communist girlfriend. In 1940, he marries a communist woman. Two months later, he's still hanging out with his communist girlfriend. He asked the communist girlfriend to marry him twice. While he's at Los Alamos, understand, the communist girlfriend is involved in enough where she's under FBI surveillance and her phone is tapped. None of this has anything to do with Senator McCarthy in the 50s. None of this has anything to do with the Robert Downey Jr. character in the Oppenheimer movie who doesn't appear on the scene until 1947. Right? Understand, before all of that, before the bomb, Oppenheimer is hanging around a lot of communists. His landlord, the two women he's sleeping with, the couple who he trusts with his baby, they're all communists. So is it a reach for people to speculate that given that he's hanging around high-functioning communists, right? His girlfriend is a Stanford doctor, Stanford-educated doctor. She's a psychiatrist, right? Given that he's hanging around high-functioning communists, given that the Chevalier incident involves a invitation made by a colleague to Oppenheimer to leak nuclear secrets to Russia. And given that nuclear secrets were leaked to Russia, is it that much of a reach, is it that unfair to suspect that Oppenheimer may have been involved in the leaking? Folks, I don't think it is, right? We don't know with certainty whether Oppenheimer was leaking information, but I believe we do know with certainty that Oppenheimer enjoyed communist women at a minimum, that Oppenheimer was close to multiple communists, that Oppenheimer attended communist events, that Oppenheimer married a communist woman, Right? All of that is true. And all of that predates the Robert Downey Jr. character and the 1950s. Right? So let's not get so PC where we decide, okay, gee, you know, Oppenheimer helped the country. He couldn't possibly have also been leaking atomic secrets. Right? Let's not whitewash history. Let's be honest with ourselves and say, you know, we're not exactly sure. But it's possible, as the movie points out, that Oppenheimer got his security clearance in the 40s because he was tainted. And the feeling was they could use that to control him. They could use that to actually surveil him. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video. Let me also point out too that this video is not intended to be homophobic. Right? It's not intended to suggest that women can't drink. The point I'm simply making is Oppenheimer took risks that were outsized by 1930 standards, right? I'm also intrigued by the fact that 
it's his fellow Berkeley professor who actually finds his girlfriend's body and then doesn't immediately call the police even though the belief is that she killed herself or may have been murdered. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.